Welcome to Mr. Haberman's History. We have a brief look that we want to do on the Renaissance, and um, so let's take a look. Spend a few minutes looking at the Renaissance. All right, so the Renaissance. The thing to understand is this time period that we have from 1350 to 1550. Europe is recovering from the Black Death. Now, the Black Plague, we've talked about this. Rats come on ships, perhaps Genoese, um, some Italian merchants, Florentines, Venetians, we don't know. Um, they brought it to Europe, and uh, over the course of the 1300s, one-third, that is, one-third of Europe dies due to this thing. It's monstrous, um, it's horrible, people think the end of the world has come, it's the sign of the apocalypse. And yet, there are some lights at the end of the tunnel, as horrific as it is. Um, first of all, feudalism breaks up, and so uh, you no longer have the system of lords and knights and clergy um, kind of lording it over the commoners and the common man who um, really live a very poor and menial existence. Uh, and so the value of um, labor for the common man spikes. And for the first time, you can live a dignified, middle-class life as a blacksmith, as a farmer, as a tanner. And um, you don't have to take baloney from the lord of the manor or the abbot of the monastery. And so uh, you have the rise of this new merchant middle class, and these, these businessmen um, that really didn't exist in the Middle Ages. And in fact, you have a handful of wealthy families in Italy that become... Bill Gates, Steve Jobs style, wealthy. And uh, it's very exciting for them in trade with Turkey and through the Mediterranean and the Byzantine Empire and, uh, and eastward into Asia through the Silk Road, more on that later in the spring. Um, you have lots of money that's pouring into Italy. So, um, in addition to that, in Italy, if you grew up, if you were a little boy, little Giuseppe, growing up in Rome, you walked the streets looking at these ancient buildings that were a thousand years old. And for a thousand years, no one had been able to build these things. The, the Colosseum, the Forum, the Pantheon, and they're slowly crumbling, even as well-built as uh, the Romans had made them. And uh, there became this intense interest in the classical world. Classical is an adjective that describes ancient Greece and Rome. And in, in fact, we can almost call it a, an obsession. Almost all Roman art and architecture is completely imitated in the Renaissance world. The Renaissance is French for rebirth. Um, rebirth. They really think they're bringing back to life the glory of ancient Rome and ancient Greece, but specifically ancient Rome. This was primarily an Italian thing. Um, and so we're going to look in a, a minute at some of these great works of art and architecture. And we can see they look precisely, or almost precisely, like the sculpture and the buildings that were built in ancient Rome. And that was intentional. So, rebirth. Rebirth of what? Of the classical world of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Um, there's a new interest in Greek and Latin texts. Uh, no longer do most people speak Latin, that is the language of ancient Rome, around the dinner table. So um, your average Italian family is not saying, Marco, please pass me the butter in Latin. But um, Italian has evolved as a vernacular language. Hi, Brighton, how are you doing? Um, it has evolved as a language that people are using. But there is this revived interest in ancient Greek and ancient Roman texts, and especially the philosopher Aristotle from ancient Greece. Um, becomes wildly popular. And so these scrolls are passed around, and then um, by the 16th century, with the advent of the printing press, oh my gosh, um, these Latin and Greek texts fly around Europe. People can't print them fast enough. Um, but what we're really interested in is this interest in sculpture and architecture like we talked about, but most of all, art. See, there's this new thing that happens. It's called representational art. And we'll talk about linear perspective in just a moment. But what do you need to know when you need to know about Renaissance art? The Ninja Turtles, that's what. 
Raphael, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Donatello. The Ninja Turtles are actually based, um, named after uh, four of the great Renaissance artists. And we'll look at their art in just a moment. Um, representational art. What are we talking about when we say representational art? What we mean is linear perspective is discovered. Um, that is the way to depict three-dimensional objects, right, like you and me in space, on a two-dimensional surface. So on a flat canvas or a wall if you're painting a mural. All right, and um, we'll look at that in just a moment, how that's done. The philosophy philosophy behind that is that art is supposed to look like, it's supposed to represent the world around us, whereas medieval art in the Middle Ages um, knew there was no linear perspective. It didn't matter if art looked like the thing, so if you painted an icon of Holy St. Haberman, all right, it didn't matter if it actually looked like St. Haberman, it just had to represent the idea or the symbol of how saintly Haberman was or whatever. So we'll look at some medieval art in a moment as well, and we'll see that it's not three-dimensional. You don't have the linear perspective, and it's not important that um, the icon of me looks like me, but rather that it represents holiness or the trinity or saintliness or whatever particular miracle that saint had performed. Um, so it's the idea that was more important than the actual shape of the person and his eyebrows and his beard and his whatever. All right. Um, so that was medieval art. Um, in addition to linear perspective and representational art, also the human becomes important. Uh, and human society. And we call this humanism. And it's a development of the Renaissance. Previously in human history, um, the importance of the individual, the beauty of the individual, the genius of the individual didn't matter that much. Um, rather, in fact, in the medieval world, this world, the world that you and I live in and we talk in, the world into which I was born and the world I will leave when I die, this world wasn't the important thing. It was a shadow. The world to come, the heavenly world, that was the real thing and the important thing. And I'm not saying that perhaps um, many of you or me don't believe that the world to come isn't important now, but in the Middle Ages, it really overshadowed this world. It really did. So um, how healthy, how wealthy I was in this world didn't matter as much as the fact that I was preparing for the next world. Well, in the Renaissance, humanism evolves. And uh, it says that what happens in this world is important and there's some beautiful things here we should stop and smell the roses and um, paint them while we're at it and sculpt the human form in all of its stunning beauty while we're at it and they did sculpt the human form in all of its stunning beauty as Google image will tell you very quickly if you Google image Donatello's David be prepared for what you see um, so this is uh, humanism as it develops as well the Renaissance soon spread to Northern Europe, um, up through France into Belgium and Luxembourg and what we now call the Netherlands, into England and Germany and Scandinavia. And uh, later on in the next few years when you have to read, get to read William Shakespeare and you growl at him and think it's cruel and mean, you can thank the English Renaissance for William Shakespeare as well. All right, let's take a look at some of these Renaissance artists and their artwork. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 